This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivian. We begin the hour in China, where Typhoon Infa is making landfall on China's east coast. The National Observatory has issued an orange alert for rainstorms, red alerts for storm surges, and high waves have also been issued. Local officials have launched emergency response operations and flood prevention measures. Heavy rain is expected in eastern regions, including Shanghai and the provinces of Jiangsu and Anhui. Officials and volunteers in East China's Zhejiang province have been racing against time to implement emergency measures. Infa is bringing heavy rain and strong winds as it makes landfall. CGTN's Gao Ang reports from Zhejiang on the preparations. 51-year-old Chen Miaogen is reinforcing a house for local residents in Zhejiang province. Their aim to help it stand up against the incoming typhoon. I'm very happy. Volunteers have come to home to fix windows, doors and walls to prevent any damage from the typhoon. I'm very grateful. Chen has been a volunteer for 16 years, fixing houses, relocating residents to safer places and saving crops, all part of the volunteer preparation efforts ahead of a storm like this. Because the winds have crushed some rice paddies, Chen says they'll have to reap it by hand instead of using a machine. If the rice falls and sprouts after a typhoon, it will be all wasted. Now we must rush to save over 500 kilograms of rice. And ports have also strengthened measure to prevent ships from being damaged. This is one of the largest havens for boats here in Zhejiang province. And behind me, all these ships have returned to the port to ensure their safety ahead of the typhoon. Infa has already brought huge rainstorms to some of East China's coastal areas over the past few days. Zhejiang province has upgraded its emergency response to the highest level on Saturday and is expected to brace for more rainfall and winds. Gang, CGTN, Zhejiang province. Typhoon Infa is expected to make second, a second landfall on coastal regions of the city of Shanghai and Zhejiang province. All flights at Shanghai's Pudong and Hongqiao airports have been cancelled. All high-speed trains coming in and out of Shanghai will also be suspended between 7 p.m. on Sunday and midday on Monday. Parts of Shanghai's subway will run at reduced speed. Many scenic areas have also been closed. In Fujiang province, over 13,000 people have been relocated to safer ground. Some rail services have been suspended. Coastal scenic spots and ferry routes have been shut. Meanwhile, recovery efforts have begun in central China's Henan. Much of the province was devastated by heavy rain and floods this week. Shen Zhuang reports from the city of Xinjiang. The city of Xinjiang has finally seen the sun after days of heavy downpour. But while some streets have started to dry off, others are still underwater. I'm currently at the front entrance of a driving school in the city of Xinjiang. As you can see, the parking lot behind me is covered by water. However, the speed of the water flowing out onto the street is very fast. That means the city is in its recovery process. And many hope the city will resume its daily operation as soon as possible. The school director says the losses could wing up costing thousands of dollars. Water was up to their knees on the worst day. Right now, the entire parking lot is underwater. We want to get water out of the motorcycle practice area. That's also covered by water. Swin says some of the staff have been trapped here for more than three days. Water and electricity supplies are stable, but for safety purpose, they are shutting it off to prevent leakages. When this happened, my staff and I were all here. The speed of the water pouring in was fast, so we were only able to save some of the cars and electronic equipment. Bus services have resumed in parts of Xinjiang on routes with little to zero water accumulation. Most residents say they commute using shared bikes by car or on foot. 
Chen, a coach at the driving school, says it is still quite hard to get to the school as northern parts of the city are still submerged in water. I rode my electric bike over. Most of the streets are okay to go on now. There's still the risk of external flooding getting into the city. Volunteers are working to block the rising waters of a canal with sandbags to prevent it pouring into the city. They hope with the good weather, the city can get back to normal. Sun Ziyuan, CGTN, Xinxiang, Henan Province. We move to India now, where over 100 people have been killed in disasters caused by torrential monsoon rains. Downpours have lashed the western state of Maharashtra, triggering landslides and floods. Authorities say hundreds of thousands of people have been affected. The Navy and Army are helping with rescue operations in coastal regions. India's meteorological department has issued red alerts for several regions in the state, with heavy rain still in the forecast for the next few days. Well, Pracheta Sharma, who is a local journalist, joins me now from Mumbai. Thank you so much for joining us, Pracheta. The flooding in India has led to very tragic consequences. What's the latest in the casualty figures? And also, if you could speak to us about the rescue operations. Right. Uh, so far, the figures that we're getting from the ground right now are uh, that there are at least uh, 150 people reported dead across Maharashtra state. And uh, outside of Mumbai, the districts that are the worst hit are on the coastal belt of the state. Uh, there are several parts of these districts that are still submerged, so it's extremely difficult right now for the rescue teams to help those who are still stuck in many of these villages. Uh, there was water which was seen as high as 15 feet, which was basically drowning all the homes and all the hutments in most of these rural areas. Uh, so this has been a particular challenge because now that the roads have cut off, uh, the water has still not receded. Most of the rescue operations are being carried out through aerial rescues, uh, which makes it a limited rescue operation. Uh, hence, it's really, really difficult right now for the rescue team to get to the ground and rescue those who may still be stuck inside their homes. They've been without power and any sort of mobile connection. So far, the figures that we've, we've got from the government that about 90,000 people have been relocated and evacuated from these places after the floods. And there are still many more who are stuck out there. So uh, we, I was still waiting to get an update, but the rescue teams are waiting for the water to recede in many of these parts before they can get out there actually on the ground and pull out people from their homes where they're trapped in. A very dire situation indeed, Bertretta. Well, red alerts have been issued for several regions with heavy rains right. still being forecast. What are authorities doing to prevent further loss of life and suffering and also damage to major infrastructure? Right. I think one of the biggest lessons that uh, the authorities have learned is to ensure that people are getting moved out of these uh, uh, spaces where there is a red alert right now. So the regions that are already flooded and submerged, there is a red alert again in these spaces. So to ensure that right now there aren't any uh, casualties involved, uh, they are making sure that first they are prioritizing saving human lives. When it comes to Mumbai City, uh, the uh, local authority is actually doing a crisis survey of all neighborhoods and communities, identifying buildings that could be potentially vulnerable to any onset of heavy rainfall in the next 24 to 48 hours. In Mumbai city itself, we've seen at least uh, a dozen uh, of uh, building collapses and wall collapses in the past one week of these deluge. And about 30 people have lost their lives in a city like Mumbai. So infrastructure-wise, the authorities are right now working on an SOS operation, going around identifying these buildings and immediately evacuating these structures and relocating these people to a safe space. Thank you so much for all that. Prachetta Pratish Sharma is a local journalist and she's speaking to us from Mumbai. Well, Africa has won her first gold medal at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics this morning when Tunisian teenager Ahmed Hafnaoui produced a stunning victory in the 400 meters freestyle final. The 18-year-old was so shocked to see his name in the gold medal position on Sunday that he didn't believe his eyes. Hafnaoui powered home over the last 50 meters, touching the wall in three minutes, 
43.36 seconds, far quicker than the three minutes, 45.68 seconds he swam in qualifying on Saturday. Australia's Jack Malachin will won the silver medal and U.S. swimmer Kieran Smith took the bronze. Hafnawi, whose father Mohammed Hafnawi was a former member of the national basketball team, will race in the 800-meter freestyle on Tuesday. His gold took Tunisia to the top of the African medal charts with a gold and silver. On Saturday, Mohammed Khalil Jindabi bagged Africa's first medal of Tokyo 2020 with silver in the men under 58 kilograms Taekwondo after being outscored 12 to 16 by Italy's Vito de Laquila. Well, Tunisia's Ahmed Hafnawi has shocked the swimming world with a stunning victory in the men's 400-meter freestyle final. The 18-year-old, who just three years ago finished eighth in the same event at the 2018 Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, has given Africa the golden lift off it needed at these summer games. CGTN's Daniel Williams reports from Tokyo. A real shock in the pool here at Tokyo 2020 and a first gold medal for Africa at this Games. That's because Tunisia's 18-year-old swimmer Ahmed Hafnawi managed to claim gold in the men's 400-meter freestyle, shocking uh, the rest of the field. He qualified as the slowest swimmer uh, of the eight-man field and managed to uh, swim a time two, more than two seconds quicker than his own personal best, touching down ahead of Australia's Jack McLaughlin and USA's Kieran Smith. Uh, he just said simply afterwards that he was shocked. He looked genuinely surprised with his success. Uh, but what success it is, of course, and following in the footsteps of the great Tunisian swimmer Usama Miluli, uh, who, of course, won gold uh, both in Beijing 2008 and London 2012. A fabulous effort and Africa's first gold medal. Dan Williams, CGTN, Tokyo. Well, let's not take a short break and return to more news, including... High infections among the unvaccinated in the U.S. for some states to reintroduce COVID-19 restrictions. And we revisit the major oil spill in Mauritius and track progress made in cleanup efforts a year later. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? or what you make happen for yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live, find your voice. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Live. We head over to the U.S. where some states are recording the highest rates of infection of COVID-19 since the pandemic began. Health experts warn it has become a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Toby Muse reports. Concerns are growing that the United States could be on the verge of a fourth wave of coronavirus infections as the numbers keep rising. This sustained raise began at the beginning of July. The U.S. had been down to an average of around 10,000 new infections a day. Since then, it's been steadily climbing and now stands at around 40,000 new cases every day. Doctors say the virus is spreading because of the slowdown in vaccinations in this country. Still less than 50% of Americans are fully vaccinated. 
States with lower vaccination rates like Missouri, Arkansas and Louisiana are seeing some of the sharpest rises in new infections. Alabama's governor is blaming the unvaccinated for the rise in infections in her state. Almost 100 percent of the new hospitalizations are with unvaccinated folks and the deaths are certainly occurring with unvaccinated folks. Folks supposed to have common sense. But it's time for to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, not the regular folks. It's the unvaccinated folks that are letting us down. Alabama has the lowest rate of vaccinated in the country, with just one in three people there fully vaccinated. This comes as the White House is reportedly considering recommending a third booster shot for the over 65s and those who have compromised immune systems who have already been vaccinated with the Pfizer or Moderna shots. New York's Mayor Bill de Blasio is urging private companies to demand their employees get vaccinated. He has suggested that he will introduce similar measures for hundreds of thousands of municipal employees in the city. Some unions say they will oppose such a move as it infringes on their members' rights to choose. All of this comes as businesses and institutions continue to debate when to reopen their offices. Such demands for vaccines are rare but could become more popular in the future. Delta Airlines requires new employees to be vaccinated. San Francisco was the first major American city to demand that all employees get vaccinated or face fines. Around 20 bars in Los Angeles are demanding patrons show vaccination cards or recent proof of testing to be allowed in. Toby Muse reporting for CGTN, Arlington, Virginia. Well, while some African countries report battling the, a third wave of the COVID-19, Algeria and Tunisia are already experiencing a fourth wave of infections, according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Lucas Anyawa has more on that story. As many as 29 out of 55 African countries were experiencing the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic as of July 22nd, according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Out of these, 20 countries have experienced a more aggressive third wave than previously observed. Two countries, Algeria and Tunisia, have however already drifted into the fourth wave of the pandemic. Algeria has recorded over 157,000 COVID-19 cases since the start of the pandemic, while Tunisia has so far reported 550,000 infections. 38 countries are now reporting the Alpha variant, while 21 countries have reported the Delta variant. By Saturday, infections in Africa had passed the 6.4 million mark. Of these, 162,437 have died. Africa has administered just 61 million vaccine doses against a population of 1.3 billion people. Part of the problem lies in low access to vaccines. Some African nations are relying on the global vaccine sharing scheme, COVAX, or donations. Others have placed orders that are yet to be delivered. The Tanzanian government says that it plans to vaccinate 60% of its citizens under a preliminary vaccination plan. This is a reversal by the new government of the country's earlier stance on COVID-19 vaccines. Tanzania, Eritrea and Burundi are the only countries on the continent who have not begun vaccinating their citizens. CGTN's Isaac Lukanda reports. Tanzania's government has announced that it will start by vaccinating health workers on the 24th of this month, just days after COVID-19 vaccines arrived in the country. While the government had earlier indicated that it was looking to various sources for COVID-19 vaccines, the number of doses or their manufacturer is not clear at this point. Authorities say the vaccines are not mandatory, but individuals will be required to sign a disclaimer before receiving them. They say providing access to Tanzanians traveling abroad is one of the major reasons behind the decision to import the vaccines. At the moment, the health ministry reports that 682 patients are receiving treatment for COVID-19, up from around 408 about two weeks ago. In an effort to keep this number from rising, the government is urging the public to be extra vigilant and has banned all unnecessary public gatherings. The vaccination drive is one of the recommendations of a special committee formed by President Samia Sulu Hassan earlier this year to advise her on how best to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. The importation of COVID-19 vaccines is a clear departure from her predecessor, who often expressed reservations about them, particularly their safety. 
For more than a year, Tanzania had not issued any figures on COVID-19 cases, and the country's leadership was often criticized for having a relaxed approach to the disease. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. We head over to South Africa now, where the COVID-19 vaccination rollout for all prisoners is now underway in the country's correctional centers. The government has launched a campaign to vaccinate prisoners at a number of approved sites across the country. With the details, here's Hilary Sanjamela. The vaccination drive will take place at 90 prison facilities countrywide. The facilities have about 170,000 inmates. The rollout is intended to prevent outbreaks across facilities that have the potential to spread the virus to communities. We are obliged to provide vaccination for correctional officials and inmates to prevent outbreaks and ensure that basic rights of inmates, officials and the wider community are protected. It is also helpful to vaccinate the inmates because here yeah, there are officials who work, also the inmates go to courts, they go to hospitals and they interact with society and the officials also interact with society. So vaccination of inmates also protect society at large. To date, over 291 correctional services officials and 85 inmates have died from COVID-19. Minister Lamula, who officially launched the vaccination program, says the department will work against time to meet the August deadline to provide COVID-19 vaccinations to over 8,000 inmates and personnel per day as set by health authorities. This is in meeting the target of ensuring that we make vaccine accessible to all South Africans. This program today shows that making vaccine accessible to those, to all South Africans, it really doesn't matter where they are, they've got to be able to have access to vaccine. Just over 1,500 inmates who fall into the 50 to 59 age bracket have already been vaccinated. There's a lot of, of, of concern with people saying they don't know how is it going to treat them, how is it going to affect them. So, you know, I, I decided that by stepping up, you know, in the kitchen, there's not a lot of us, but stepping up, it, it, it will help people to say that, okay, it's, it's worth it because someone took that first step instead of just sitting and saying, no, somebody else will do it. Let me be, you know, a, a, an example to, to my fellow inmates. The fear that I had previously um, has now obviously overcome. I'm, I'm actually happy to, to be vaccinated today. Inmates are receiving the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is to avoid the administration of Pfizer's vaccine second jab. The vaccination will take place every day in selected facilities. Yuli Sanjamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. In Uganda, some health experts are concerned that millions of people living with HIV are at risk of getting severe COVID-19 symptoms because many of them have not been vaccinated. About 1% of the population in Uganda have received a dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. The country is under a strict lockdown after cases went up in June, causing a shortage in hospital beds and oxygen supply. CGTN's Isabel Nakura reports. Herman Suruga has battled two viruses, both HIV and COVID-19. She found out about her HIV-positive status in 2018 and believes her ex-boyfriend infected her. Accepting her status was hard, ending up in a psychiatric hospital. She began treatment and was coping well, but in June, the new wave of COVID-19 in Uganda hit her too. You know that fear. I got scared and then I remembered but if I fight it, HIV, I, I fight it AIDS because I had AIDS. I fight it AIDS and now I'm having HIV. So I can fight this too. Hama's COVID symptoms were mild and she quickly responded well to treatment. Not all people living with HIV have beat COVID. The UNAID says people living with HIV stand a higher risk of severe infection and death. In Uganda, a bigger percentage of people have not been vaccinated, exposing more of them to the dangers of COVID-19. Hama has not yet received a vaccine and can't even have her HIV condition reviewed by her doctor because of lockdown restrictions. Before the lockdown, I had my stock covered. I had my, my treatment covered. But my challenge would be I can't access 
clinic when uh when I get something like which affects my health, like for go for violent test and everything, I can't access the clinic. That also affects me. Campaigners in Uganda are concerned that containment measures are affecting timely medication in HIV patients. Uganda has 1.4 million people living with HIV and 1.3 million of them are on antiretroviral treatment. We saw a lot of people, especially during the lockdown, die. Many of them missed getting their medication because they could not travel. People living in Kampala who get their medicine in Gulu and vice versa. UNAIDS says Uganda's AIDS-related deaths have gone down by 60% in the last decade due to adherence to drugs. But there are fears that this could be reversed if millions like Hamar do not have access to medication. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. Well, China's successful economic and development model continues to generate positive feedback across Africa. Under the Chinese Communist Party, the country has significantly reduced poverty and become an influential country globally. In Cameroon and Senegal, political party leaders have applauded the tremendous progress China has made over the past century. The two countries are encouraging more South-South cooperation to achieve development for their economies. This year, China and Cameroon celebrated 50 years of diplomatic relations. Over the last few years, the two countries have seen fruitful results through cooperation on various fields. Political parties in Cameroon say working with a partner like China has been immensely beneficial, as the Asian country has become an important force on the international stage. China leads the world in technological innovation and also in cultural innovation. Chinese culture 30 years ago was not what it is today. No one imagined that the whole world would start to speak the Chinese language. Today, countries are struggling to get Confucius centers opened at home. This is called cultural influence. On the geocultural level, China has influence. It decides at the level of the Security Council. It is really extraordinary. The Chinese Communist Party was able to anticipate the end of the Cold War and to reorient its policy internally and externally. The message we want to send to China is one of encouragement. We really want them to stay the course. What impresses us the most is the way China has succeeded in eradicating poverty, which is the worst enemy of humanity. To succeed in eradicating poverty is to achieve a work of peace. In 2005, China and Senegal restored diplomatic ties. Bilateral trade with Senegal now tops a billion dollars. The two largest parties in Senegal say China's amazing progress is commendable. In fact, what impressed me the most was the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has succeeded in making an absolutely prodigious leap in China in a hundred years. We don't realize this progress enough because we are not in China to follow the different historical sequences. But we must know how in a hundred years China has proceeded to reach this current level of development and also measure the number of obstacles that this Asian country has had to overcome. As a political party, we congratulate China for this fabulous result achieved through its courage and culture of work instilled in the people. It's even in this sense that we as the Senegalese Democratic Party have been able to imitate the ideology of China while adopting the slogan of this party, which is, you have to work, a lot of work, still work, always work. The Chinese Communist Party is the central key to the Chinese political system, and it is thanks to this organization and ideology that China is today a powerful and coveted nation beyond the world. China-Africa cooperation has been seen as fundamental for Africa's development. The Asian country has grown to be very influential in global governance, health partnerships, international development and economic growth. Noktula Shabalala, CGTN.
In news, Justin China's Chuanzhou World Ocean Trade Center in Song Dynasty and Yuan Dynasty project from the historical city of Chuanzhou have been added to has been added to UNESCO's World Heritage List. The UN organization made the announcement on Sunday during the 44th session of the World Heritage Committee of UNESCO. Well, let's now recap on our top stories. Typhoon Infa is making landfall on China's east coast. The National Observatory has issued an orange alert for rainstorms. Red alerts for storm surges and high waves have also been issued. Typhoon Infa is expected to make a second landfall in coastal areas of the city of Shanghai and Zhejiang province. Africa has won her first gold medal at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics this morning when Tunisian teenager Ahmed Hafnawi produced a stunning victory in the 400 meters freestyle final. Hafnawi powered home over the last 50 meters, touching the wall in 3 minutes, 43.36 seconds. And some U.S. states are recording the highest rates of infection of COVID-19 since the pandemic began. Health, some health experts warn that it has become a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Concerns are now growing that the United States could be on the fourth wave of coronavirus infections. And those were our top stories. Let's not take a show break or any turn your business news, including... Africa, days are at, after days of looting and vandalism, a logistics utility firm in South Africa is now dealing with a hacked online system. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just a table mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live, find your voice. Now, now for the business news. South Africa's ports operator Transnet is working to get its system back online after they were hacked. The state-owned entity had been on high alert after looting, vandalism and arson in KwaZulu-Natal province, which affected its operations. It's now investigating whether the cyber attack may have been linked to the recent unrest. TGTN's Julie Shire reports. South African state-run logistics and ports operator Transnet was dealt another blow this week. A cybersecurity breach knocked out its vital container terminal operating system, forcing the entity to revert to old methods. When you start taking that system out of the equation and, 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 and go back to a manual basis in the sense of running with um, LibreArch files and, and forms, you don't have the staff or the resources to maintain that, which means the efficiency of that port itself is then impacted. The port of Durban, also one of Africa's biggest terminal, was recently shut after looting and arson in the KwaZulu-Natal province. Calm has returned and operations were recovering, but this glitch will cause further setbacks. That's going to have a knock-on effect to things like um, any of the goods that we need, some of the fresh goods that we need, some of the foods that we need. Uh, some of the parts and components that we need. I just think about some of the car manufacturing um, plants that have components being shipped in that could bring a um, motor vehicle manufacturing plant to its knees. Imports and exports were under pressure from COVID-19 restrictions. Delays are now expected to drag on for much longer.
We currently have a container sitting uh, ready to leave. Due to the unrest, we were unable to, port went into lockdown, so we were not able to send that container out. So clients are waiting for them um, in uh, our international countries of exports, example, New Zealand, um, the United States, uh, uh, United Kingdom. However, um, what has now happened is going to impact us uh, greatly and uh, this is going to now cause uh, financial implications. South Africa is investigating if the cyber attack is linked to the recent unrest. I think all of these, these public um, sector infrastructure um, installations around the world, not just South Africa, are always under threat and under attack. Um, and I think it's just there might be a coincidence between what's happening with KZN and, and our team with regards to the, the destabilization. I don't think there's any evidence to, to bring the two together. The majority of these attacks um, are probing activity so they can try and get some monetary gain. Cape Town and other ports in South Africa are now functioning manually. There's no clear indication from Transnet when systems will be back and running again, but it's likely to have a significant impact on the already ailing economy. Julie Shara, CHTN, Cape Town, South Africa. As Ethiopia's economy grows, so does the demand for a bigger, faster delivery network that can help businesses reach clients across the country. It's led to the emergence of startup companies focusing on logistics. One of them, parcel delivery service Ishi Express, which has caught the eye of a new investment group, the Addis Ababa Angels, who are hoping to tap into a growing sector in the Ethiopian market. Coletto and Joy tells us more from Addis Ababa. Hello, Ishi Express. With inquiries about deliveries coming in by phone, as others are prepared for dispatch, it is a busy morning at Eshi Express. The firm, based in Addis Ababa, is one of Ethiopia's newest logistics companies and has developed a specialist app for clients to make orders. Co-founder Tigabu Haile says there is a ready market for his services. One is the big corporates who have like a day to day thousands of deliveries per day and they are doing in-house. Or, or like they have challenge on it. And plus e-commerce companies. Yeah. As a company, how we see our services, we want to help companies to grow without any additional cost to them. The company is the latest to be supported by the Addis Ababa Angels Network, a newly formed group of professionals looking to invest in tech startups. They have their eyes firmly on Ethiopia's future. I always say this all the time. Uh, you just have to look at where Kenya is and some of the other regional countries, Ghana, Nigeria, and so forth and so on, to, to realize where Ethiopia will be two years, three years from now. So it's a matter of investing in the right technology firms and the right sort of uh, infrastructure companies that, that will be able to, to take advantage of what's, what's, you know, what's already happening. As well as buying shares in the logistics company, the Angel Network also offers mentorship and a sharing of expertise in areas including marketing and communication. The company is currently doing an average of 150 deliveries in a day, but it says it has a target of reaching at least 3,000 daily in the next 18 months. The company is using the funding it has secured to invest in technology to ensure deliveries meet expectations. We recently launched our Ishi customer app, our agent app, as well as our internal dashboard, where, which is what we use to track um, shipments from point A to point point B end to end uh, and it also allows customers to track their orders once they place an order on the customer app they can follow the messenger all the way through to delivery. Low internet connectivity remains one of the biggest hurdles that this company will have to grapple with as it strives to expand but company bosses hope that plans by the Ethiopian government to support the wider use of digital technology will allow logistics companies like this one to really take off. Koleton Johi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Zimbabwe's government recently approved amendments to a Securities and Exchange Act to include a virtual assets like cryptocurrencies whose trade is thriving despite them being unregulated. CGTN's Ryan Mokotuya spoke with a cryptocurrency trader about the growth of the pace. Tatenda Mataure started trading cryptocurrency in 2017 with just 30 US dollars, which he since built into a portfolio worth thousands. Whereas if you have acquired the right skill set and you sort of know what you're doing after a few trials and errors, you can make yourself maybe 50, 60 US in a day. Whereas as I said before, you were like, this is what I'm working for in a month. So financially it starts to make sense. In 2017, 
Zimbabwe Central Bank shut down the country's first Bitcoin exchange, saying it did not recognize virtual currencies. However, that's not stopped traders from buying and selling them, especially as they offer a store of value and are a way of supplementing incomes in a high inflation environment. The only way to monitor the cryptocurrency trades is by watching what's happening on social media platforms. Um, such as WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, you know, whereas some days the groups would be like, hey guys, I'm selling $100 worth of Bitcoin, $200 worth of Bitcoin. Now you can wake up in the morning, guys will be like, I need 50000 worth, I need $200,000 worth, you know. It's, the space is growing. And this is what we said to the regulator that, look, these trades are happening with or without you involved. In recent weeks, monetary authorities seem to have begun warming up to cryptocurrencies. Previously, the central bank was hesitant to legitimize virtual currencies because of the high risk of potential fraud. But now, perhaps realizing that the global trade cannot be ignored, is working on a framework to regulate them. Meanwhile, players in the space are also actively engaging authorities. If you want to do anything on a national scale, um, you have to have the authorities involved, you have to have the taxman involved, and you have to have some kind of deposit protection and... Uh, structure to it. Uh, my company, Bitflex Fintech, we're working closely with the regulators and we hope to have a very um, friendly solution available to the public very soon. That will hopefully see cryptocurrencies added to Zimbabwe and US dollars, plastic and mobile money as the diverse modes of payment accepted here. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. July the 25th marks a one year since a Japanese cargo carrier, MV Wakashio, ran aground on the reefs of Pointe Disney and Mauritius, about 1.5 kilometers off the country's southeast coast. The ship spilled approximately 1,000 tons of oil in the Indian Ocean, endangering coral reefs and lagoons. This ecological catastrophe at the heart of a biodiversity hotspot captured global attention. Our correspondent Lu Feifei gives us an update on the situation there a year later. The Wakashio oil spill affected some 30 kilometers of this pristine coastline. And for the residents of these affected coastal villages, they were dependent on this coastline for every aspect of their lives. It's where they live and where they make their livelihood, from fishing and marine tourism. And the double whammy of COVID-19 border closures and the oil spill grounded life here to a halt. But now there's renewed hope for the future. Meet Davina and Christoph Bullock. They own and operate a diving center near the Wakashio shipwreck. Like I'm born in Mayburg with the families who were fishermen, grandfathers, uh, anchors. So swimming, diving, snorkeling was one, one of the favorite activities where I was born. So my DNA was in the water. That's my passion. Uh, I started scuba diving when I was 14. And I think now it's like uh, 15 years uh, I'm in the water. March 2020 was a very great year for us because it was a dream come true. My husband and I were able to open our diving center, but unfortunately a few weeks after it was the pandemic of COVID-19. After the lockdown, we say we are ready now to go back in our business, but unfortunately we never imagined that we are going to have the oil spill of Wakasho. It was one catastrophe after another and it was very difficult for us. The Wakasho oil spill brought out the extraordinary and ordinary Mauritians. They are the real heroes, sacrificing their health, time and even their hair to contain the spill. The Vina was on site coordinating the volunteers from day one and Christoph, he made countless trips to contain the spilled oil and later helped to clean the mangroves. The whole community were here on the waterfront of Maibo to do whatever we can. Despite not being expert in oil spill, we used artisanal booms with sugarcane, artisanal booms with hairs to clean the lagoon of Mayburg. Through the combined efforts of the Mauritian people, government agencies and civil society, the cleanup was declared essentially finished by January. But many questions remain. A top-of-mind issue for local residents is the full extent of damages and compensation. I have been a fisherman since 40 years. 
We have not go fishing for about eight months. I can say that uh, we fishermen community in the southeast coast of Mauritius deeply had help from the government of Mauritius and also from the Japanese company. The government gave us uh, the assistance, but we fishermen, we think that it's not enough. And now, at the one year anniversary, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So now everyone is rushing back to the, to the sea again to do kite surfing, windsurfing, scuba diving, like everything is looking back to normal now. And we are waiting for the borders to open again to start all our activities with the tourists again. This is not the end of the Wakashio story, just the beginning of a new chapter. Resilience and determination from the local residents, together with the restorative abilities of Mother Nature, has brought back this slice of paradise. Liu Feifei, CGTN, Point Jerome, Mauritius. Radio astronomers from the University of Pretoria in South Africa say they have discovered a group of 20 new galaxies. The find was made using the country's Meerkat telescope, which is one of the world's most powerful radio telescopes. According to radio astronomers, the new group of galaxies were found in a well-studied part of the sky. Here's CGTN's Travis Andrews with the details. South Africa's Meerkat radio telescope has made a significant discovery. A group of 20 new galaxies have been found. These neutral hydrogen gas-rich galaxies were discovered hiding in plain sight by radio astronomers from the University of Pretoria. They discovered the galaxies in a well-studied region of the skies, and it was possible because of meerkat sensitivity to radio waves. Most star-forming galaxies are embedded in a cloud of neutral hydrogen gas. Um, and this gas is only observable at radio wavelengths, so with radio telescopes like Meerkat. Um, and even then, it's extremely faint. And because of Meerkat's amazing sensitivity, we were actually able to detect this gas. Um, and in addition to that, Meerkat has a very large field of view, which means it's able to observe quite a large um, portion of the sky at one time. And that led us to believe that these galaxies all were not just individual galaxies floating through space, they actually um, were related to each other and um, they were a group. The Meerkat Radio Telescope is the precursor to the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, which will be the world's largest when completed. According to radio astronomers, the galaxies were not just individual ones, but are actually related to each other and are part of a group. This suggests the galaxy group is still in the process of assembly and has not yet undergone evolutionary processes. We found that this galaxy group is in the early stages of forming, which is a unique snapshot of the lifetime of a galaxy group. And this um, is a piece of the puzzle of how um, galaxy groups are form and how the galaxies in groups evolve together. Um, and this can tell us a lot about even our own galaxy group. The discovery of the galaxies may be significant, but experts believe new and similar discoveries will also be made by the Square Kilometer Array. Now that project's construction phase was given the green light recently, and first science is expected in 2022. That is Andrew CGTN, Cape Town. Well, Cameron has not won an Olympics boxing medal for 37 years, but on Saturday, welterweight Albert Ayisi gave the country hope of landing on the podium when he completed a third-round stoppage of fellow African Dlamini Tabiso of Iswatini. Ayisi advanced to face Aidan Walsh of Ireland in the round of 16 on Tuesday. CDTN's Jane Kia reports. Cameroon's Albert Ayisi Mengi produced a fast victory for the country's boxing team on Saturday in the round of 32. The referee stopped his contest against fellow African Tabiso Dlamini of Eswatini two minutes and 35 seconds into the third round. He advanced to face Aidan Walsh of Ireland in the round of 16 on Tuesday. In his last training session before departing for Japan, Ayisi had promised to shine at Tokyo 2020. I'm going to Tokyo with the hope of winning an Olympic medal. I even want to bring the first Olympic gold medal in boxing to my country. I have confidence in myself and I have the support of my coaches. The 22-year-old athlete secured his Tokyo 2020 sport at the African Olympic Qualifier Tournament in Dakar, Senegal earlier this year. His convincing victory against the Biso is seen in Cameroon as a step forward for boxing. 
This first victory traces the path of Albert Ayesi. It is obvious that he will go very far in this Olympic tournament. It is true that he will face a difficult and very agile opponent. His future opponent is Irish, and we know that speed is very important in Irish boxing. Irish boxers are very fast and their opponents easily take knockouts. Albert will have to be very concentrated because the slightest mistake could be fatal for him. But with the preparation and the will to win that he has, I believe that he will return to Cameroon with at least the bronze medal. I think that Albert Ayisi has all the chances to go very far. In previous Olympic Games, Cameroonian boxers were usually eliminated in the first round. But when they pass this round, they become very serious competitors. We have to trust these young boxers, and we really hope that they will go all the way and bring us a medal. I am very happy to see that Cameroon has real lions. I am not a big fan of boxing, but this fight made me really happy. In front of my TV set, I could see the tenacity of this boxer, and I am very proud of him. I wish him to go very far, because what I saw during this fight really impressed me. I also wish that all the Cameroonian athletes who are in the Olympics do like Albert. Cameroon entered three male boxers in Tokyo 2020 in its 15th consecutive appearance at the Summer Olympics. The Central African nation has won two Olympic medals in boxing, silver at Mexico City in 1968 and a bronze at Los Angeles in the 1984 Games. After 37 years, the new generation of Cameroonian boxers carry the weight of expectation to bring a medal back home from Tokyo. Jane Kale, CGTN. Surfing enthusiasts around the world are riding a wave of optimism following the historic inclusion of the sport in the Olympic Games. In South Africa, it is hoped that the sporting code's debut at Tokyo's 2020 will inspire a generation of youth living in impoverished communities. Here's CGTN's Julie Shire with more. Surfing has long been considered an elite sport in South Africa and has been out of reach for its largely poor population. In recent times, it's used to empower children who grow up in the midst of crime and gang violence. They end up joining gangs and they end up taking drugs and they start to misbehave and they cause chaos or they start trouble in the community. And the reason starting with for Change was to give opportunity to young people to also have a supervision and also like give them guidance. The organization uses coaches from the community who can relate to the hardships and focus on building important life skills. Some kids like experience emotional abuse, being like emotional abuse and some physically and then others don't even have parents. When they come here we give them like a safe space where they feel comfortable, they can share whatever they want to share with the coach. When the year we won and we forget about what's happening at home. You build your self-esteem and your confidence in the water and makes you develop more skills and stuff as yourself. News that surfing is now an Olympic sport has boosted confidence in this community. I, I could see one of the kids that have taught them how to surf, being like, maybe I'm seeing them on one of the Olympics. I would be like, so excited. Nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. You just have to believe in yourself. It's a great opportunity. It's a great platform to be out there so that for them to dream that one day I would like to represent South Africa at the World Olympics. Jordi Smith will be the first surfer to represent South Africa in Tokyo this year, bringing the Olympic vision within sight for many. Julie Shara, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. The Tokyo 2020 Olympics have been severely impacted by the pandemic, and amidst fears the games would be cancelled, attention is now turning to the athletes. But with coronavirus cases on the rise, the fear for many athletes remains a positive test that could end their dreams. CGTN's Dan Williams reports. Despite a year-long delay, competition is finally and officially underway at Tokyo 2020. Organizers of the Games hope the focus will now switch to headlines more centered on the celebration of sport. But the impacts and concerns around the coronavirus pandemic remain. For athletes, the potential of having an Olympic dream brought to an abrupt end due to a positive test adds yet further pressure. Australian Murray Stewart is competing at his third Olympics, having won gold in the men's canoe sprint at London 2012. You, you get someone who comes in and gives you a swab on a day and says suddenly you can't compete for 
no fault of your own um it's yeah it's 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 a a, a layer that we haven't had to deal with ever and it's um it's going to be very fascinating to see how it plays out because um it will be the a cause of a lot of stress for a lot of athletes, I'd say. Murray won gold at London 2012 in the men's K4 1000 metres. Four years later, he competed in the solo K1 event, but just missed out on a medal by a heartbreaking three tenths of a second. That level of disappointment um, is is hard to ex- to to explain when when you're comparing with the just the sheer joy of getting the the gold medal four years prior to that. Set. Yep. I've definitely taken a step back and while gold medals are, are very important and you know, are definitely nice shiny things to have, they, they really don't define the whole experience. And so for me, um, I, I definitely take that attitude going into Tokyo this time around. For many athletes, the Olympics is a step into the unknown. The canoe sprint team, for example, hasn't raced internationally for two years because of the pandemic. Stewart will be back in the K4 here in Tokyo, and at the age of 35, he's aiming to finish his career on a high. Maybe it's greedy to, to want a medal when you've already got one, but um, for me, that would be the, the absolute dream to, to finish off what has been quite a long career for me. The build-up to this Olympic Games has been like no other. Some feared it might never happen. There will still likely be further significant impacts and issues, but the hope remains that the athletes really can take centre stage at last. Beautiful man. Dan Williams, CGTN, Tokyo. And after some rugby news, we return to South Africa where the British and Irish Lions came from 12-3 down at halftime to beat the home side 22-17 in the first of three tests at the Cape Town Stadium on Saturday. World champion Springboks were the dominant force in the first 40 minutes but were soon powerless as the visitors racked up 19 points to draw first blood as discipline cost them in the second half. CGTN's CSJ Proceed brings us all that action. The 22-17 defeat will be a bitter pill to swallow for the world champions who were outplayed in the second half of the opening clash of the much-anticipated series despite a dominant display in the first half in the mother city. But South Africa coach Jacques Nienaber refused to use the COVID pandemic and the lack of game time as an excuse for the loss. I mean, it's well documented that we haven't played a lot of rugby together. And I think it would be naive to say, listen, it doesn't have a, 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 or um, it might affect our cohesion. But if you look at what happened in the first half, I thought we had good cohesion. I don't think we can look at that as an excuse and say, listen, no COVID is the reason why at the second half we didn't dominate the air or had parity in the air, you know, we, because we did it in the first half. The men in green and gold will be extremely disappointed to have been subdued by the visitors' clinical second half display. But, as skipper Sia Khaleesi explains, work needs to be done in order to avoid making the same mistakes in the next showdown. They won every single ball. Most of the ball is in the air and the scraps, the balls around, uh, things that we normally get and things that we normally win, we actually lost it today. And our discipline is actually one of the biggest things. They had more opportunities than us and they used it well. Big up to, um, well done to them, um, but we'll, we'll start working from tomorrow. Straight away recover and then work again and us as a pack will look at what we need to fix. The scene is set for a fiery clash next weekend at the Cape Town Stadium. For the Springboks, introspection is required, but with a solid first-half performance, it won't be panic stations for the think tank that includes the most overqualified water boy in rugby, World Cup winning coach Rassi Erasmus. While for Warren Gatlin and his gallant Lions, a massive confidence boost and now an opportunity beckons to seal the series against the world champions with a match still to be played but they will be expecting their hosts to improve and to play like wounded beasts next Saturday. CS2 Plus C, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember that you can send your feedback to the contact on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. From me, Hannah Vivia and the rest of the Africa Live team, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next time.